Hello, I'm Dr. Christopher Rapuano, and I'm Chief of the Cornea Service at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. I'm here with Dr. Clark Chang, the head of the contact, specialty contact lens service at Will's Eye Hospital. We're here today talking to you from the Will's Eye Society newsroom at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. So Clark, we're here to talk about keratoconus. Can you tell us briefly what is keratoconus and who does it affect? Sure, be happy to. Um, so keratoconus is a visually devastating disease for a lot of patients. Um, as the, what it is, is inherently your cornea gets weaker and cornea is the clear transparent outer covering of one's eye. As the tissue gets weaker, it's no longer able to hold its shape. And uh, because the shape is, of your cornea is one of the most important elements in regulating visual clarity, vision starts to get worse and deteriorate uh, to the point where it cannot be corrected by conventional means like glasses and contact lenses. So it can make it very challenging for patients to even do the simplest daily activities in their life. Uh, and that's why it's so difficult to uh, manage this disease. And what age uh, do people get keratoconus? Um, eye doctors and vision scientists consider uh, keratoconus to be naturally progressive and can start at a very young age. Um, typically, that's say around age uh, 10 to 20 and continues to get worse on its own up to about age 40 to 45. However, because there are cases that have been reported to uh, start earlier than 10 and also get worse beyond the age of 45, it's important to know that age is not always predictive of what this disease is going to do. I, I agree. I've seen patients younger than age 10 and certainly patients progress over age 45. Right. I think sometimes it has to do with eye rubbing. Absolutely. Eye rubbing is one of the risk factors yeah. for keratoconus and if people rub their eyes at a young age or continue to rub after age 45, right. I think that it can make it progress. And I think that also points to the importance of seeing your eye doctors to control conditions that may cause eye itching, like allergy or dry eye, as well as it sort of highlights the importance of getting a really well-fit contact lens on the eye. That's great. Um, what are the standard treatments for keratoconus? Um, standard treatments in by convention has been a little bit of way and see type of approach and by that I mean we typically try to give patients their best vision possible when keratoconus is mild and the shape is not too pointy uh, glasses and regular contact lenses could work as it gets worse it uh, those tools no longer work and a contact lens specialist would have to design customized specialty lenses to cover up the defective area in order to restore their vision uh, and then we basically try to over time Time determine who may need to go on to need corneal transplant. So, right, so contact lens, glasses, soft lenses, and then the specialty contacts. Occasionally we'll use intacts, little pieces of plastic sure. we can put in the cornea to reshape. I personally don't think that that works all that well. We certainly try to avoid um, transplants uh, unless Absolutely. we really need to. Whenever we can. Now, there's a new procedure um, to help keratoconus patients. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, and to your point, probably help us to maybe defer the need for corneal transplant. And so cross-linking, corneal cross-linking, uh, was approved by FDA in uh, 2016. And what it is, uh, it's been studied for a long time um, other places, and from the, our registered clinical trials at Will's Eye, as well as those studies around the world, it's been shown to stop uh, and uh, ideally uh, stop or slow down the uh, progression of the disease. And what it is, it combines uh, riboflavin eye drop, which has very similar composition as vitamin B, as you know, uh, as well as combining that with a very carefully calibrated UV light device. And then two combined um, can uh, lead to result of strengthening a weakening cornea and thereby, again, achieve the purpose of, uh, of uh, slowing down or stopping the disease and making the patient hopefully stay in their contact lenses or glasses for as long as possible. Great. So who should consider corneal cross-linking? Um, corneal cross-linking primarily, um, the primary population of this uh, of this treatment should be those who with keratoconus um, who have shown documented trend of progression. Now I want to make a very important point. So that's regardless of how well you think you see in your glasses or contact lenses because a lot of people think if they see well they don't need any type of management. Um, so it has to do with more uh, whether or not you're showing any trend of progression or worsening and that's why it's important to see your eye doctors regularly to monitor your corneal shape uh, as well as your corneal thickness and your visual function. Um, 
Secondarily, those who may have uh, risk of uh, progression, such as what you've talked about, people with uh, habits of heavy eye rubbing with the palm of their hand or their knuckles into their eyes, maybe family history, as well as those who are younger who we think statistically are naturally going to get worse. I think that's another group of people who could consider uh, learning, at least learning more about cross-linking and certainly seeing their eye doctors more often to learn about cross-linking and specialty contact lenses. Right, I agree completely. So if patients who, especially the younger patients, those between you know, 10 and you know, 25 or 30, and right. if their vision is getting worse or if they're deemed by their eye doctor on the special measurements, um, topography and things like mm -hmm. that to be getting worse, cross-linking has been shown 90 to 95% of the time, if not more, to stop the progression. Absolutely. It doesn't usually make it better. Sometimes it will, but it doesn't usually make it better, but will usually stop the progression. So those are the patients that we see and that we follow. Right. Um, it's also, there's also an approval for people who have had certain types of refractive surgery that may weaken their cornea where it actually gets worse and worse, and those can be uh, treated with it too. But it's mainly the keratoconus patients. Absolutely. And it's also important to, if I may add, it's also important to know that with the FDA approved procedure, um, our expectation for this, uh, for after cross linking, as you said, it's 95% chance of success and pr practically the only management that has proven to be successful in stopping and slowing down keratoconus. But our expectation for the patient is that the first, early on the first week, as they're recovering, the vision is typically blurry. Right. Um, they may have a little bit of discomfort and may not, um, but typically discomfort is very well managed. And we then expect them to go on and have a visual fluctuation for up, on, up until about two to three months. And those are the results that we showed in our registered clinical, clinical trials. And after some people may actually uh, start to see better earlier if they can resume their contact lens wear or if we determine that they could be fitting a contact lens earlier. So those would be the basic, uh, my basic expectation in patient education with regard to corneal cross-linking. Right. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we've been talking about keratoconus. I'm Christopher Rapuano here with Clark Chang from the Cornea Service uh, at Will's Eye Hospital. We're talking to you from the Will's Eye Society newsroom in Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Thank you.